All right, cast player. All right, so cast player, when you are doing this, you um, you have to enter in your data into your matrix. So that means you would need to go to second x to negative one to obtain your matrix. Okay. Now, when you sit for your exam, all of this will be empty. So actually, let me go ahead and let me reset that real quick. Okay. So you go to second x and negative one, and this is exactly what you're going to see. There's going to be nothing here. Okay. So then you'll go over to edit, and then you'll enter in your data into matrix A. So um, when you type in your matrix, you are only typing in your raw data, no total. So if we're using that example, what is the dimensions? Is a what by what? We're looking at example five from the review packet, the last review packet that I gave you. Two by 12. Five? Five. Wait, what question? Number five. Okay, looks like we got some discrepancies here. Five is a t -test. Ah, yeah, so number five is a t test. Number five was a t test. Okay, um, but since I've already started with chi squared, whatever the dimensions are, so if it's a three by three, you would enter that in. For number 16. Okay, let's look at 16. What are the dimensions on number 16? Can you use a four by two? Confirmation? Yeah. Four by two. Okay, so then let me go ahead and fix that. I'll be a four by two. And then you'll type in your data, your raw data. What is it going uh, across? 12, 15, 19, 17, 25, 20, 23, 19. So you type everything in. You want to make sure that you close out of the matrix before you start trying to perform any type of test because it'll do it inside of the matrix if you don't exit out of it. So second quit or second mode so you can quit out of that. Then you'll go to stat, you'll go over to test, and then you'll go to option C, which is a chi-squared test. Option D is a goodness of fit test. Um, and the problem will say perform a chi-squared goodness of fit test if they want you to do that. But also, goodness of fit is actually done in your list, not in your matrix. Okay? So then you'll go there. And as long as you put your raw data, your observed data in the matrix A, then you are good to go to calculate. So then your chi squared test statistic would be 0 0.957. Your p value would be 0.812. Um, and remember, you would reject. Your null hypothesis if the p value is less than the significance level. Do you have to go on the matrix B and change the dimensions, or do you just leave it alone? You will leave the matrix B alone. Okay. Because mm -hmm. the matrix B actually will populate itself for you once you perform the test. Okay. okay. And so if you needed to see something, you would just go over to edit, and then those are the expected values. Now that's not how you would show that the expected value for this entry is 12.78. That's not how you would show it, okay? Remember to show an expected value, you need to take the row total, you multiply that by the column total, and then you divide by the overall total, to actually show that the expected value is um, 12.8 to three significant figures. What was the row total for that very first row? 27? So then it'd be 27. What about the column total for, for that second column? What was the column total? Yeah, 79. 79, and then what's the overall total? 150. 150. So real quick, if I do 27 times 79 and divide that by 150, are you sure? It's 71. 71. Okay. So yeah, that'll make a difference because it should be the exact same thing that was in the, the table. So 27 times 71 divided by 150 
and there it is. That's the same expected frequency that was in that first row, first column spot. So then you would write 12.78 and then 12.8, and that's how you would show that the expected value is 12.8 to three significant figures. You just can't say, oh, it's in the matrix. No, you got to do the math. T test is always pulled. Remember when you go in and you uh, to sample T test, there it is. You'll type in your data into L1 and L2. Frequencies will stay as one. And depending on whether or not the alternative is not equal to less than or greater than, you'll choose that option. Pooled is always yes. I reset my calculator so it defaults to no, which means you'll have to change that over to yes before you actually calculate your t test. Question. How do you know if the whole frequency is equal to less than It's going to be based off the problem because for a t test, the null hypothesis for a t test is always mean one equals mean two always but there'll be something in the problem to indicate what the alternative is going to be so i think you said number five was a t-test right yes is the farmer's interested in seeing whether the number of kilograms per plant in these two groups is significantly different it's significantly different it didn't say he wanted to see if the values were less than the others or greater than the others he just wanted to see if they're different which means that in that particular case, in number five from the last review I gave you, your alternative hypothesis would be what? No, not equal to. Not equal to. But like it will be within the problem. So you'll definitely have to make sure you read the problem to know if it's going to be not equal to, less than, or greater than. Other questions? Yeah. Can we go over a binomial distribution question? Yep. And then, Roger, what was your question? Uh, how do you know when to use one bar versus two bar stats? To be honest, you won't use two bar stats. Two bar stats is, um, and, if, and I got you on binomial um, uh, distribution. Two bar stats is when you have two different pieces of data and you, like, say you need to find the mean of both pieces of data. That's really the only time that that would be useful. But to be honest, to keep any type of confusion down, just use one bar statistics, and that will give you what you need to just change out the list if you need to find the mean of each. So one bar stats will be what you use to find Q1, median, Q3, standard deviation, mean. All of those are in one bar stats. Number four from our last issue. Perfect. Okay. Uh, number four from your last test. Your last mock test um, dealt with binomial distribution. It says that when Mitch takes a free throw in a basketball game, the probability that he scores is always a const constant at two thirds. So that means that P would represent two thirds. He takes nine free throws. Nine would represent your N. And it said, let X be the number of times he scores. You have to be able to identify when you're dealing with a binomial distribution problem, okay? If there are a certain number of trials, if he's performing the same type of event or the same type of experiment multiple times, like nine times, it's going to be a binomial distribution. If there's a probability of him consistently doing this event, that's the probability part of a binomial distribution, all right? So when it asks you what's the probability that he scores exactly seven times or the probability that he scores four or more times, you'll use your calculator to do that. You would write those type, uh, this type of notation on your paper to indicate that, okay, well, one, this is a binomial distribution where these are my parameters. If I'm looking at for exactly seven times, I go into my calculator. I go to. Wait, what does the N represent? The nine? The, the, num the, num the number of trials. Yes. Yeah, so since he's shooting nine free throws and he can make a free throw two thirds of the time, 
N will be your nine and P will be your two thirds. Okay, thank you. No problem. So you'll go to second bars and then you'll go to binomial, either PDF or CDF. What was the difference between the two? So one is for exact probabilities and one is for range. Which one was for exact? PDF. PDF. Which one am I using PDF for? The, the seven one. This one is PDF, this one's CDF, because CDF represents the range. So if I want exactly seven, that means I'm gonna to go to binomial PDF. What's my number of trials for this problem? Nine, what's my P? What's my X? Seven. And so all you would write is point two, three, four to actually get your probability. Not much work can be written. I mean, there is a formula for this that I showed you guys, okay? So you could do the actual formula, which was this. Is that in your reference booklet? I'm not quite sure. So you would have to remember it, but that is the technically the work to go with exactly seven in the pink. If you use CDF, what did I tell you about CDF in the calculator? You can't do greater than, so you have to do one minus the rest. Exactly. What is the rest? Um, four out of nine, so uh, five. Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> like, like when I meant like the rest, if this is supposed to, if I'm looking for the probability that it's four or more, then and CDF can't do anything greater than, it can only do the ones less than, I have to do the probability that I'll be less than or equal to three. And then I have to do the complement to find that probability. So second bars, binome CDF, trials are still the same, probability is still the same, but this time my X value is three, not four. Not four, it's three. So then I'll do one minus that answer to actually get the probability that is gonna be greater than or equal to four. How about I round up three significant figures? I use normal CDF, but Whenever I think they give you like the probability, instead you use inverse norm, right? Correct, correct, correct. So for normal distribution, uh, the CDF is when you're looking for a probability or a percentage, then inverse norm is when you are looking for a particular X value. So that means you were given the probability already or the percentage that it's less than or greater than a particular value and you're looking for that x here so let's say you knew that it was 10 percent greater than some x value am i using cdf or inverse norm inverse norm inverse norm now if you have a newer calculator remember you just have to tell the calculator what tail to do so the area would be 10%, so 0.10, the mean would be, I'm just making this up, 50 and the standard deviation would be five. What would my tail be? Right. It will be right. This is if you have a fancier calculator and then it will give you your X value. How However, do you the tail to turn on? If, if you do not have a newer calculator or updated version, it doesn't have the tail. So when I originally taught this to you guys, I taught it without the tail because I had the older calculator. That's my old video has the older calculator. So for you guys, what you have to do, for those who do not have the tail option, you always have to do the probability that's to the left. So in this particular case, I'm not, you wouldn't type in 0 0.10, you would type in what? 0 0.9. 0 0.9 or 0 0.90, because remember there's 100% underneath the normal distribution curve. Okay, because your calculator automatically will do a left tail every time, every time. 
So you won't have to worry about the tail. You just have to make sure that you put in the probability that's to the left of the line, even if it's telling you that 10% is greater like it is in this problem. So then when you paste, you get the same value. Yes. Or binomial uh, CD, CD. Yep. How would you, like I forgot how do you do the X and Y's ranking in the diagram? Um, so the number 15? Yes. Okay, so number 15 in your review, when you had to rank them. Give me a second. Okay. Um, so uh, remember you go from unless, unless the Spearman's rank table has a few values filled in with the rank, you do it by smallest to largest, okay? So if you look at the X values that were on, uh, that were in that table, here, and you had to provide the rank for them, you would go from smallest to largest. So what's my smallest value? Or actually, sorry, my bad, my mistake. Largest to smallest, you go largest to smallest. It'll be 70. So this will be rank number one, and then you would continue to go from largest to smallest, ranking them from one to eight. So then your next smallest will be 37, then 34, 25, and so on and so forth. Yes, I get that question wrong. I just put the template. Okay. All right. Well, then let's 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 take a look at this one. All right. Correction. Correction. It is smallest to largest. So, if in this particular problem, if you did go largest to smallest, there's a possibility that you guys got that one wrong. It is from smallest to largest. It is from smallest to largest. How can you tell? If it doesn't provide a already ranking for you, it's smallest to largest as a default. But sometimes, like in your um, mock paper two, the very first one, they gave you some of the entries already. They gave you the first value and the last rank, or the first rank and the last rank, which lets you know that, okay, in that particular problem, it went from largest to smallest. But if you have to rank them yourself, you should go from smallest to largest in that way. So then... This will all be reversed. What if your values were tied? You would have to like add up the ranks that they would be and then divide it by how many ranks there were that were like the same. Mm -hmm. So like if this one was, if this value here was 15, technically these two, would be five, four and five, but because they have the same value, they can't have different ranks. So you would technically take where they're placed, what their rank would be, and then divide by two or divide by however many spaces they take up. And so then the ranks would then be 4.5 and 4.5 anytime it's tied. And then you have to skip to six. And then you have to skip to six, essentially, because that's how it would fall in the rest of the rank. So optimization, okay, that dealt with derivatives. That's when you were trying to either maximize something or minimize something, okay? But you can always figure this out by setting the first derivative equal to zero, okay? When you set the first derivative equal to zero, you find the respective x value that would produce the maximum area or the minimum cost or the maximum profit or it, so on and so forth. It's like the last one. So like in number 19 from your review packet, you had this uh, cylinder that had a cone on top of it. Right here it says, find the length of the cylinder L for which the volume is a maximum. It was part F, 19F. Right there, you would take your 
Uh, actually, actually, no, this one was a little bit different. Since they actually gave you your R value in part E, that would maximize, that would uh, provide a maximum volume. Let's actually do E instead. Does it show that V is a maximum when R is equal to the square root of two over pi? Well, in order to show that the volume is maximized or is a maximum, you would have to take your derivative, which should have been 10 minus five pi r squared, and then set that equal to zero. You would take your first derivative, set it equal to zero, and then solve for r. By doing this, you find the value of the radius that would produce a maximum volume. And since this was a show problem, you already knew what R was, you just had to show it. It's about the steps. Anything that is minor, simple, common, don't skip it when you're doing a show problem. Literally show every step, including the final answer from beginning to end, because you don't know where the marks are going to come in a show problem. But that's how you would do optimization. You set the first derivative equal to zero to find out where something's going to be maximized or minimized. If you have two values, like when you solve, how do you know you have a maximum? If the numbers in the left are are positive and the ones on the right are negative. When you put it on a number line, if it goes, if that value, if you have two of them, goes from positive to negative, you have a maximum. But if it goes from negative to positive, you have a minimum. Okay? So you will put those values on a number line, test a few, test one to the left, test one to the right. If it goes positive, negative, you have a maximum, negative, positive, you have a minimum. So refresh your memory on that. Actually, real quick, um, in your reference booklet, they give you this. In your reference booklet, that's power rule, okay? The first one's for derivatives. This is what they give you for integration. Like that's in your reference booklet. So if you have a power function such as 2x to the third minus 4 over x plus 2, and you were asked plus 3, and you were asked to find the derivative of this. Remember, for derivative, you take the exponent, you bring it down to the front, and then you subtract 1 from your exponent. So what will be the derivative of 2x to the third? 6x squared, because that 2 in front, you would multiply 3 and 2 together to get 6. 4 over x is the same thing as saying what? 4 times 1 over x. Hold on, wait, wait. It's the same thing as saying 4 times x to the negative 1 power. Power rule only works if it's your variable raised to an exponent, not in a denominator. So you want to take the derivative of this instead of uh, 4 over x. So when you bring that exponent down to the front, that turns into what? And so negative. A negative 4. So since there's already a negative in front, then what does that become? Very good, and what's the derivative of a constant? Zero. So this would be six x squared plus four over x squared. That's your derivative. It's almost like negative four x and the x is already in the numerator, and so it's just a number in the denominator. You bring this number up? Uh, no, so, so you're asking like, what if you have four x to the third over three? Yeah. That's the same thing as saying four thirds x to the 
So you wouldn't bring the three up. It's this multiplied by three times the four over six. Correct. So this would, uh, just turns into four when you do the derivative. Diana, what was your question? Correct. That's your laws of exponents. Correct. Correct. And you got to remember to always subtract one from your exponent. That's why we get a negative two. So that's the derivative. If I want to do the integral, okay? If I want to do the integral. So that same function, I'm gonna go ahead and write this as a negative one, okay? Because I know in order to do integration or derivatives, that needs to be x to the negative one. I would actually, y'all ain't gonna have nothing like that in the integrals because we never went over that. Let's just take that out and turn that into just a regular four x. You actually won't have any of those for um, integration because there's actually a, a rule that you use with that that you didn't have to know about it. But with integration, you add one to the exponent and then divide by the new exponent. So when I add one to three, what does that become? Four. So then I divide by four. So this becomes 2x to the 4th divided by 4. Yes, definitely. I was going to do that after I did all the integrations. Then you would have here, you add 1. So that becomes x to the squared. So then I divide by 2. And then what does 3 become when you take the antiderivative? 3x. You just add an x to any constant. So then our final answer for the, well, not our final answer, but the antiderivative of it would be one half x to the fourth minus two x squared plus three x. And with integration, you have to remember the plus C. If you're given other information, such as a point, then you can plug that in for x and y, solve for C to get your full equation. That's this is the indefinite integral. Yes. Question. Can I solve for C? Sure. So let's say we were also told that we were uh, the point zero one lies on the original function. So you would plug in one for f of x. You would plug in zero for every x into your new function that you found and solve for C. So then C would equal one and your function would be one half x to the fourth minus two x squared plus three x plus one. Okay. Uh, you probably won't get the final point because you actually got to write the full equation. Yes. If this was on our page two, the problem would probably look like the pink part would be like an A, and then the second part would be a different a B. section. Mm -hmm. okay. And to be honest, they probably would do it like if it's if it's a paper two, finding the antiderivative will be an A. Mm -hmm. Then they will like find some creative way for you to find the point. Like they'll give you x, and you've got to find y some way. Mm -hmm. And then you would use that answer and plug it in to get the full equation in like a part C. If they asked that, what you only have to do is plug in y and like look for x straight Yeah, anytime they give you a like an x value, you can always plug it into your original function and get a y, or you can look at the graph to get the y. Yeah. Old concepts that we ain't done in a while. Can you um, like 
We've been talking about like what formulas look like what in a graph. Like, I don't know. I don't know if it's like displaying how to do certain lines or how to do certain Oh, oh, okay, 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 gotcha. All right, so when you're graphing, when you're graphing um, any type of equation, okay, and they give you a graph, and the, these are the easiest two or three points that you could possibly get. Why? Because you guys have the luxury of having your calculator. So then that way you can put it in your calculator and literally just copy it over. What trips of students on the graphing part is if they say, oh, we'll graph X between like, and they give you this. That means all they wanna see is that part of the graph from zero to three. And then however the Y's are. Don't let this be, um, don't let this be a word problem where X represents your time and Y represents like the, the depth of your wave. So not only do you need the respective um, scale, right? But now you also need your label. So don't forget about your labels. I, I'm just, mind you, I'm making all this up. <laughs> On both your X and your Y. Depth of wave. You couldn't even hurt to label this X and Y. Please, if they give you a centimeter paper and you have to create your own X and Y axis, do not, like pretend like this is your grid, right? Mm -hmm. And you put, this is your X and this is your Y. Please do not put, don't do this. Cause where's your X axis? Oh. It's up here. Put your zero, your one, your two, put that here. Do not put that on the end of your paper. Same thing with your watch. I don't know who taught y'all this. I didn't teach you, but yet and still, y'all still did it on some papers. Don't do that. Wherever the X and Y axis are, you put the numbers with the axes, not on the edge of the paper. So do not do this. Hold on, let me emphasize this in red. Do not do this. Do this. Okay, wherever you put your X and Y axes, do this. Remember what your sinusoidal functions, okay? That's um, sine and cosine. Uh, you had your general form. I do not remember what letters I used and I do apologize. Okay, remember A, was associated with your amplitude. It was always the absolute value of A. So if your equation was like negative two sine six X minus three, your amplitude would be a positive two, not a negative two. That tells you how like steep your, your not how steep, how high your wave went, okay? I told you how high your wave was. So from some midline, and up, that was A. You found that by doing max. Minus min over two. Thank you. Okay, that's how you found the value of A. So let's say they gave you the graph and they gave you your highest point and your lowest point. To find A, you would do that with the Y. So whatever the Y's were, subtract them, divide by two. Um. This one here represented your vertical shift. That's if the graph got moved up or down. It also represented your midline, like the line that went through, smack dab through the middle of your graph. It's this. Okay, you found that by doing the opposite, max plus min divided by two. B was associated with the period. The period was equal to 360 divided by B, okay? So whatever the period was, in other words, how long it took to complete one full cycle, that length was called your period. It was the horizontal distance from beginning to end or from max to max or from min to min. 
you would set that equal to 360 over B to find the value of B or to find the period. So like in this example, 360 divided by six would equal 60. Your period would be 60. It will complete one full cycle in 60 degrees. Your amplitude would be two. Your midline or your vertical shift would be negative three. So the graph will be shifted down three units. Are there any variations of um, yeah, but you won't have to worry about, it. we'll see. I mean, and this could be cosine instead of sine. So this is for sine or cosine. It was the same setup. Outliers. Remember, outliers are values that are far from your data, they could skew your data, your standard deviation. The formula was 1.5 times your IQR, okay? Remember, you find your IQR by doing what? More than likely, you would find that in like a previous part of the problem where they'll tell you what it is. So let's say your IQR was 14. I don't know why I picked 14, but that's fine. <laughs> You will multiply that by 1.5 to get 21, I think. Yep. 21 is like that magic number. You would add that number to Q3, and you would subtract that number from Q1 to essentially find a range. Okay? So let's say your Q3 was 30, and your Q1 was 16, okay? So 16 minus 21 is negative five. 30 plus 21 is 51. Anything outside of this range would be considered an outlier. So anything outside of this range is an outlier. Can you also go over like a question where it talks about like increasing and decreasing like intervals with like maxes and mins? Uh, go over a problem. I mean, I go over the concept. I don't have a problem unless someone can find one in a packet or something. But when you're increasing, that's when your first derivative is greater than zero. Decreasing. That's when it's less than zero. So remember on a number line, you know, we'll put that value on a number line and we'll see if it's positive and negative. That means we'll have a maximum. The reason why we have a maximum is because the original graph is going up. And then at that particular X value, it's gonna be going down. So it'll be increasing up until that X value and then decreasing afterwards. And we will find that again by setting the first derivative equal to zero and then putting that value on the number line. For the cumulative frequency, yeah, for the cumulative frequency line, um, can you review the equations for that first? Okay. Oh, cumulative frequency. Remember, your median is found by doing n plus one divided by two. Your Q one n plus one divided by four. Q3, 3, n plus 1 divided by 4. These do not tell you what the median is or what Q1 or Q3 are. They tell you where to go on your cumulative frequency axes to find your Q3 and Q1. You would draw over your horizontal lines 
drop down a vertical line, and then that X value is your Q3. That X value is your median. This X value is your Q1, okay? Those formulas, again, they do not tell you what they are. It tells you where to find them on your actual curve or in your actual table. Oh man, I made me forget something. I was going to go over something. Something that was always missed by y'all. Um, oh. Oh. You have to write that equation in the form of AX plus BY plus D equals zero, where A, B, and D are elements of, a little louder, integers. Integers, integers are what types of numbers? Whole numbers, whether negative or positive. They are whole numbers that are positive or negative. This right here, one is not in that form. So that means that you have to get everything on one side and set it equal to zero, correct? Mm -hmm. The easiest way would be to subtract over the Y. Are these integers though? No. You have to multiply every single term by three. Oh, so many of times y'all would miss that. Every single term, two thirds times three is two, two times y, or three times y is three y, three times seven thirds is seven. You multiply by the common denominator. So if the denominators were different, you would have to find the common denominator. Man, I would have missed that right now. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, and then the equation for a perpendicular bisector. I was about to ask, can we just do 14 as a Renault problem? 14? Yeah. Sure thing. Okay. Looking at that review packet, number 14. So uh, in number 14, part A, you were asked to find the equation of the perpendicular bisector of AB, which is this line right here. To find it, you need to find two things. And I've been preaching this from the beginning. You need two things to write the equation of a line. You need the slope and you need a point, okay? In a perpendicular bisector situation, the slope is found by finding whatever the slope of AB is and then doing the opposite reciprocal, okay? The point that you need is going to be the midpoint of that segment, okay? So again, to find the equation of the perpendicular bisector of AB, you need the slope of AB and then do the opposite reciprocal, and then you need the midpoint of AB. So slope is found by doing Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. That becomes 10 over 20, which is just one half. That right there is the slope of AB. So what would be my perpendicular slope? Opposite reciprocal, very good. Now you need to find the midpoint. That's the sum of your X's divided by two. That's the sum of your Y's divided by two. That would be zero over two, which is just zero. 30 over two, which is 15. Does it say how to write it? Do I have to write it a particular way? Mm -hmm. Just the slope intercept. Slope intercept form. Zero, 15. That would be called a what? What kind of point is that? Yes, it is the midpoint, but on a graph, what would that be? It'd be the y intercept. Zero, a number, is your y intercept. So if I'm writing this in slope intercept form, that's negative two plus 15. If it wasn't the y intercept, we would plug zero in for x. 15 in for y, negative two in for m, and then solve for the y intercept. Then it asks you to find the coordinates of v1. Well, that's nothing but the intersection between the perpendicular bisector and, is that what a was? Yeah. 
Yep. And so it would be the intersection between this line, which was y equals x, and the equation we just found. So you would set these two equal to each other. You can do that in your calculator. You could also do that algebraically. Uh, 3x equals 15. X is equal to 5. Plug it in, and you find out that it's the y value is 5 as well. So this point was at 5, 5. Since they're both in the form of slope intercept, y equals x and y equals negative 2x plus 15, you can just set them equal to each other because they're both equal to y. So then you do it that way. If not, you can just plug it in y1, y2, see what the intersect. And uh, uh, we should depart C if that problem as well. Sure. It says to find the optimal position for a new bookstore so that it's far away from all the other bookstores. All right. So in part C, you were asked to find the optimal position uh, to put a bookstore so that it was the furthest away from all the other bookstores. Um, you had D somewhere positioned here, and you had C somewhere positioned up here. Okay. Now realize that on a coordinate plane, there's infinitely many points that you could put this bookstore. We're looking specifically within this Vernoy diagram. And so out of essentially you are only considering two points at this, at this current juncture. The two points you're looking at are V1, the point that you just found, or V2, which is the point 25, 5. And the thing is, you want to figure out which one of these two out of V1 or V2 are the furthest away from each of the bookstores. So really and truly, you are basically saying, OK, out of these two points, V1 and V2, because again, I'm, I got to base it off of the Renoi diagram that I'm given, is V1 further or is V2 further? And it really is going to depend on the furthest point that's away from V1 and the furthest point that's away from V2, which one is going to be your answer. As you can see in your Renoi diagram, maybe not on the board, but at least on your paper, V1 is close to A, B, and D. So you really need to figure out, okay, how far is you want away from C, okay? So you want to figure out what's the distance of V1 to C. Then look at V2. V2 is close to B, C, and D. So you want to figure out basically from A, what's the distance there? And then depending on which one is bigger, that's going to be the one that's the furthest away from all the other sites because V1 is close to all of these. So you want the one that's the furthest away from the furthest bookstore possible. And the answer happens to be, sorry, it should have been a two, happens to be V2, which is located at 25, five. And that particular point is gonna be the furthest away from any and all of the other bookstores. You would just do distance formula, which I believe is in your reference book. It is, prior knowledge. Um, any questions, comments? I was going to go over a few like just small things that you may forget. How do you determine if a sequence is arithmetic or geometric? Um, arithmetic if it has a common difference, and geometric if it has a common or a something ratio. How do you find the common difference? Um, the second term minus the first term, and then the third term minus the second. Very good. How do you find the common ratio? Um, is there ever going to be a time where they give us one of these uh, normally distributed problems and you have to find the standard deviation? Um, let's say you weren't giving your standard deviation? Yeah. Uh, not not in a way that you could potentially be thinking. Um, so remember, a normal distribution curve is split symmetrically about the mean, right? 
and the mean splits up into in half. So this is 50% and this is 50%. Um, and then everything else from there. Like um, uh, if they say like, Let me try for more example. Like I remember seeing something like this recently. Um, if you're not given the standard deviation, they'll give you something else that will help you find the standard deviation. So, for example, this question said 68% of the marks on a test are between 51 and 64. 68%. That should sound familiar, right? Yeah. 68% is what? Uh, the spacing between the First standard deviation back and forward. Exactly. That's one standard deviation. That was 68%. Real quick, what was two standard deviations? Uh, oh, that is 13.5%. Uh, Not a full way. Two standard deviations. Oh, uh, 95%. 95%. And then three standard deviations was? 100. Not 100, 998.5. 99.7, 99.7. That was three standard deviations. So in the problem, again, 68% of the data lied in between uh, 51 and 64. Since you know that that's one standard deviation and the mean is supposed to split them up in the middle, what would the, what would the mean grade be? Um, you have to add those two and divide by two. Very good, you gotta find that middle point. So what is that? So if the mean is 57.5, then you're able to find the standard deviation by just subtracting the two from each other. So that will probably be the, the bulk of like, if you did not have a standard deviation, they give you something as an indication to find it. I mean, there is another way, but you didn't have to know how to do that. Okay. One standard deviation is 68%. Of course, the mean splits that in half. So, I mean, you can figure out like each individual one, but 68, two standard deviations is 95, three standard deviations is 99.7. Uh, remember with histograms, uh, when you're looking at your group frequency table, if your values do not touch like these don't, you have to find the midpoints for your, for your boundaries because remember histogram bars touch. So that would be 10.5, 20.5, 30.5. So that means that on a histogram, if this is 10, 20, and 30, your 0.5 means that you're going to be a little bit off of like the actual mark. Okay. When you have a group frequency table and you're asked to find the mean, what do you use? Yeah, half point times the frequency. Very good. Remember, you use the midpoints. So if you find mean and standard deviation of a group frequency table. The difference between something like this, finding the mean with uh, data statistics, there's also finding the mean of a probability distribution. Prop the mean of a probability distribution is the expected value. And that's found, found by multiplying your X values by your probabilities and summing them up. So be, be cautious of that. Yeah. And for the frequency table, you do the multiply the X and the Y and then you divide it by the multiple X's. You, you multiply uh, for like for statistics to find your mean, you take the midpoints, multiply each midpoint by the frequency, add all those up and divide by the total frequency. Yeah. Or trapezoids. Yeah, trapezoids. Uh huh. You. that? All right. So, uh, when you are approximating the area underneath a curve using the trapezoidal rule, okay. 
Um, of course, we know how to do it exact. That's when you go to math, option 90, you type in the bounds and the integral. But when you're doing it using um, approximations, the formula is in your reference booklet. The values that you need to plug into the formula come from your list, okay? So remember, you go to stat, you go to edit, and then in L1, that's when you type in your zero through however many trapezoids they want you to approximate. So if you had five trapezoids, it would be zero through five. You put those into L1, okay? Then in L2, that's where you needed your X sub I formula, which was A plus I H, okay? Um, H was found by doing B minus A over N. B was your upper bound, A was your lower bound, and N was your number of trapezoids. And remember for I, we used L1. So if your lower bound was zero, I'm making this up off the top of my head, your lower bound was zero and your H happened to be 0.5, no, mm -mm. Um, to the, the 2.5. So then it would be 2.5 L1 that you would type into the title of the column. So that would be zero plus 2.5 L1. And then it would produce this is, already, this is already wrong, very much wrong. But that's how we'll produce all of those values. And then in L3, that's when you actually would type in the function with respect to L2. So whatever the function is, let's say it was the square root of X, well, you would do the square root of L2 because it'd be technically all of those values. And then it produces it for you. And those values in L3 is what you would use as your Y0, Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4 to find the estimate. These, yes, you have to know all of these. The only one that you don't have to memorize is the actual formula to find the um, estimation of the trapezoids. But H you need to know, XI you would need to know. So in, in order would be I one column. I and one column starting at zero. And then X of I and one column and then the X of F of the function or at the F of yeah. L2. Yeah. Um, how are you finding H if it's H that you need at the bottom? Mm, H is, no, no, that's, that's an N. That's an N. Oh, okay. This is an N. And that represents your number of trapezoids. Okay. Yeah. Well, the method, do you think it would show a method function from that if you just do the chart and then do the Yeah. A is the upper bound, right? A is the lower bound. Oh. B is the upper bound. Three forms of the quadratics. You have standard, most common. Factor, second common, then vertex, less common. They're called these different forms because that's exactly the information that's given to you. Vertex form, you're given the vertex, that is HK. Uh, in x-intercept form, you're giving your x-intercepts P0 and Q0. In standard form, C represents your y-intercept. You can find your vertex by doing negative B over 2A in your standard form. Um, a little addendum to this one. This is also one that I remember you guys having difficulty with. This is still factored form. 
here is just that one of your x intercepts is already zero, the other one is going to be p. Okay, these are the type where it crosses at the origin and then crosses somewhere else. So this would be zero and then this would be p. Okay, I remember y'all missing those back in the day. Okay, so the question was um with the new curriculum that was added in can I, can we expect it, that it to be on um on your test and i would say yes very much so in the past probability was like 23 25% of the exam so because there was so much to it right you could have a cumulative frequency as one question you could have like basic probability for another one like conditional or or tree diagram um and then you have one that dealt with like regression line and correlation. That's what it used to be. Now you have t test. Now you got Spearman's rank. Now you got all the probability distributions with binomial distribution. Normal was was a part of the old curriculum. That was also a question. Same thing with chi squared. Right there, I think that's like eight different topics. So that could potentially be eight different questions, or they can merge some things together. And now you have a paper two question that covers not just basic probability, binomial distribution, maybe even a little bit of normal distribution. One thing though that you do have that's an advantage is the fact that your um your paper one is different from um like your paper one those are your short response whatever was not on paper one is going to be on paper two and so you can study that and get a like have a little bit of an advantage not saying that everything else that was on paper one ain't gonna be on paper two. no don't do that but just know that whatever wasn't that's gonna be on there and then it's going to be a, a sprinkle of some of the other stuff. Answer every question. It's like the SAT, ACT, right? Because if anything, like, especially on paper two, you cannot leave one of the questions blank. That could potentially be anywhere from 13 points to 20 points that you don't get because you didn't answer it. Mm -hmm. Write down something. If you know it needs to be sine rule or cosine rule, or you know it needs to be sine rule, but you forgot how to plug in or you can't find an angle, then, then, then put that in and attempt to plug in some numbers. Even if the numbers are wrong, sometimes the marksman will say attempt to use sine rule, you get a method point. You just won't get the accuracy point because you didn't plug in the right numbers. Um, if you know you have to set your equation equal to 21 to find the intersection point, but your equation is wrong, that's another method point. They attempted to set their equation equal to 21. Go award a method point. Okay. Write down something. Don't just like say, okay, it's cosine rule. Yeah. Well, still try to attempt to plug in some numbers, even if they're not correct. When you sit for your exam, your calculator is going to be reset, which means you need to automatically do two things degree mode and stat diagnostic. Turn both of those things to turn it to degree mode, turn your stat diagnostic on. Both of those are accessible through the mode. Okay. They're both accessible through the mode. Turn those on and then start your test. Okay. You can go in any order. Usually it goes easy to hard. Okay. So if you're the type, I need to build up my confidence, do a couple of the easy ones, then try to jump to some of the ones in the back. Okay. If you find yourself spending more time on a problem, try to try to do it like this. Six marks, six minutes. Whenever that six minutes is over, like just, just kind of like after each question, look up. Okay. Okay. Like so that way you make sure that you're staying in pace. Okay. And if you happen to finish and there is time left, go back and look at what you did. I'm not saying to change any answer because usually when you go back and you change it, that's usually when like you mess up. But you don't know, maybe you accidentally typed in an eight on your calculator and it should have been a nine. Go back through and just do the math. Okay. Um, please make sure that you put the number inside the box and A, B, and C on the lines. Okay. <laughs> 
I'm trying to think of whatever little bit of stuff. I mean, I, I want to remind you of some of these things again on the day that you test. Oh, but with the, like the, anything with the TMB solver, like when it's money, do we always do two decimal places? Okay, good question. The TVM solver is the only thing that's calculated notation that should be written on your paper. No binomial CDF, no E, none of that should be written on your paper. The only thing that's good is that TVM solver stuff. As for the rounding with that, I am praying that it'll say in bold letters before the question even starts, round all answers to two decimal places. So you know that's what you're following. Otherwise, if it doesn't say that, three significant figures. I, I, I would do three significant figures over trying to do two decimal places. But my hope is that they'll say two decimal places. And three significant figures, unless the question specifies otherwise. If you can believe it exact, do exact. You have the ability to change a decimal into a fraction. OK? If it doesn't change to a fraction, now you're stuck with three significant figures. OK? Yes? It does tell you to round two decimal places. I thought there were some, uh, some, some financial problems that we round it up and some that we round it down. No, don't follow that. Just go two decimal places, like standard old school, like elementary rules. Yes. And we're going to be given a, um, a packet with all the formulas in it there. We don't have to bring our own, right? No, a, no, a reference booklet will be provided. Reference booklet will be provided. Um, but because of COVID and everything, they did say that, you know, you can bring your own pen, but I have no doubt they'll probably have pens for y'all there as well. And they'll give you a ruler and a pencil for any graphing ones. Just breathe, do your best, okay? You have history before you have math. So, you know, do well on history, concentrate on history for that Monday, Tuesday. And, but Wednesday night, after you leave, get your lunch, you need to take a nap, and then you need to, and then you need to study. The paper one from that is the afternoon, right? Correct, paper one is in the afternoon on, that thir on Thursday of next week. And so you'll have even the morning too. Make sure you wake up, get a good breakfast. Y'all got a group chat, right? Everybody needs to respond to that group chat that I'm awake. Okay. <laughs> like I'm, I'm dead serious, especially on Friday morning when y'all go to paper, paper two, because that's in the morning. You got a 7.45 report time. That 7.45 is earlier than when we start a school day. Y'all aren't on time. Please be on time for this test. Please. Okay. Because if I'm there and y'all are not there, that's not, that's not a good thing. Okay. Horrible. Very. But y'all be fine. Y'all, y'all, y'all will be fine. Just make sure that you study and just do your best. You, you spent, you spent the last two years doing this. Okay. Actually, technically the last four years because y'all were in pre-IB classes leading up until this point. Okay. And that goes the same for all of your classes. I mean, there's no pressure. This, like, this, this is, this is what you worked hard for. Okay. Now it's time to see. Did you learn anything? Or at least, can you at least pass the test? <laughs> that's, I mean, that's how the SAT and ACT are. Can you pass the test at the end of the day? All right. You have any questions as you are studying um, next week? Uh, you guys can message me. We do have testing here, and I will be administering the test here. So I will probably won't respond to the afternoon time um, or the evening time. Just, um, you know, if you, as, as you have questions, just let me know. All right. <laughs>